through 7. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree that which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will surely not die, for God knows that in the day of the you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves coverings. Please be seated. comments that you made about the song that we sang just a moment ago on ourself and all of these. And I hope that each and every one of you <coughs> I hope that each and every one of you uh, we started huh? Well, I, I hope that each and every one as we sing that song we look to see if you fit in that song sometimes, that if you were filled with pride and you are self-willed to the point that you are not willing or even interested in doing God's will, God's way, doing things God's way, are you making progress to the point of where you can honestly think of self that I am giving my God everything. I'm giving my all. I'm following after Jesus to the very best of my ability. And the reason why I asked Dale to lead that song is because it fits very well within the lesson that I want to present this morning. I want us to go back to the passage that was read by Brother Xander just a moment ago. And you'll notice that the only part that I want to focus on is the first three verses. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God has made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it, or you will die. It's interesting those three times that has to do with what was said. Satan comes and he questions and he challenges Eve in regard to God's directive, in regard to what God had said in regard to, to the trees that were in the garden and which ones were good for food and which one was the only thing that it did was present death. And so he asked Eve has God said? And Eve replies, well, God has said this. And she repeated exactly what God said in regard to the fact that not only were they to not eat of it, but they were not even to touch it. And she said to the serpent, God has said. In other words, you're challenging me in regard to my knowledge and understanding of what God's will is. I'm telling you that I know it because he said it, he made it plain, and there's no reason for me to question what he said. At that time, I like to think of it in this regard, at that time, Eve was looking at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil through God's eyes and seeing that it was something that was to be completely avoided. Now, as we would read the rest of the account, we understand and learn how that through his deception, Satan got to Eve, got Eve to look through his eyes at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 
that it was one that was good for food and a delight to the eyes and to make one wise. And now all of a sudden, what God had said seemed to be fading away, just like the rest of those verses there are lighter than the first three. In our gospel meeting, that we'll get to in just a moment, but, and Tom, I agree with you, this was a, such an excellent winter lectureship. Six lessons that were all connected and six lessons that challenged us and informed us in regard to what it means to be a Christian, how important it is to be a Christian, and to encourage anyone who is not a Christian to become one and to recognize the urgency of becoming a Christian. If you find that you are accountable to God, you're aware of the fact that you have sinned against God and that you need your sins to be washed away, then as Brother Jeremy pointed out in practically every single one of the six sermons, if you understand your need to be baptized into Christ, why haven't you done it and why are you delaying? We read in 2 Timothy 2, verse 15, that we are to show ourselves, to study, to show ourselves unto God. A workman that needs not to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of God. Or handling accurately the word of God. And there's a number of thoughts in regard to what that means, to handle accurately God's word. Some would say that it has to do with recognizing that we're not to add to or take away from God's word. Well, that's true. That's part of handling accurately when God, God's word. Some might think that it is a matter of recognizing the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And that the Old Testament was nailed to the cross, the law of Moses was nailed to the cross and taken out of the way, out of the way, and we're under a new covenant, the covenant of Christ, the law of Christ, according to Galatians. And that would certainly be a good understanding of what it means to handle accurately God's word. I want us to think in terms of handling accurately God's word in a different way. During our gospel meeting, and you're going to learn that I have several quotes that Brother Jeremy Jones gave us in the sermons that he preached. It's kind of an interesting thing. Our, our focus for the entire congregation this year is to abound in the work of the Lord. And isn't it interesting that Brother Brother Jeremy actually referred to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58 during his presentation. And I've heard a number of people comment to him that the lessons that he was presenting fit so perfectly with the things that we're studying in our Bible classes right now. And it's fantastic that he made such comments that did fit so well. And one of the comments that he said is let the word do its work. And I think that that is a good rendering of what it means handling accurately God's word. That we are to be <laughs> students of God's word. Study to show yourself approved unto God. Study to, to show God that you know what his word has to say. That it's so important to you that you are a daily student of his word. That you're not going to go to bed until you have found time to get into his word and to look and see the wonderful things that are found there. <laughs> Let the word do its work. That's just six words. Now you know me, I'm kind of verbose at times, or maybe all the time. But I came up in one of the devotions a couple of weeks ago and the discussion that we were having and I made a statement and as soon as I made the statement I said you know what I think that makes a good sermon and so over two weeks ago I developed this sermon that I want to present tonight and it's interesting how well it fits with the, God, the, the, the lectureship that we had and our emphasis for this year in regard, in regard to abounding in the work of the Lord. 
My statement was, if you want God's Word to do what it is supposed to do, you must let God's Word do what it's supposed to do. In other words, if you're going to say, I want to be a disciple of Christ, or I am a disciple of Christ, the word disciple is a learner or a follower of someone. If you're going to be a learner or a follower of Jesus Christ, then you need to let God's Word do what it's supposed to do in your life. But you are the one that has control over that. We have to let God's Word do what it's supposed to do. That must be the reason why Jesus would say, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, then do what I tell you that you need to do. You want God's Word to do what it's supposed to do, you must let God's Word do what it's supposed to do. And one of the things that God's Word is supposed to do is it defines sin for us. Romans chapter 7 and verse 7, Paul wrote, For what shall we say then? Is the law of sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to no sin except through the law. You know, it is true that moral law has been in place from the beginning of creation. God created man after his image, according to his likeness. And one of the things that God did with, with mankind, Adam and Eve and Cain and the one that came afterwards, is that there was a certain degree of moral law or moral consciousness. There are, there are certain things that nobody has to tell you that it's wrong to do that. You need to not do that. That's wrong. We don't need anybody, we need anybody to tell us that it's wrong to kill somebody else. We don't need anybody to tell us that it's wrong to steal the possessions of someone else. God has said that it's, it's a matter of covetousness when we are greedy and we want more and more and more. Need anybody to tell us that it is wrong to, to have physical relations with somebody else's wife or husband? We know that. We, we just know that within our hearts and our minds. But there are some things that we need God's law to define for us as what it, it, that it's sin, that it's wrong. Gossip is wrong. Lying is wrong. Cheating is wrong. There's just all kinds of things. Getting angry and not controlling that pride is wrong. And we need God's word to define and to tell us that it is wrong. We're told in Romans chapter 7, the same chapter, just a few verses later, therefore did that which is good become a cause of death for me? May it never be. Rather, it was sin in order that it might be shown to be sin by effecting my death through that which is good, so that through the commandment, sin might become exceedingly sinful. That's one of my favorite verses, and especially out of the King James Version, where God said that sin is exceedingly sinful. Now, all the time I was going through public school, I was told when you're giving a definition of something, you don't use the same word to, to define it, you know. But God did. He said sin is exceedingly sinful. Yeah. And isn't it funny or interesting, fascinating actually, that God in giving us a word revelation, that when he comes to defining or describing sin to us, the only thing that came up to his mind to show how bad it is is just to say sin is exceedingly sinful. I think that what God wants us to understand is this, that when we commit sin against God, he is greatly offended. It's very offensive to him. It's odious to him. It just smells bad. We smell bad because we are guilty of sin before God. We're not acceptable in his sight. We need to, brethren, we need to pay greater attention to what sin is and how bad sin is, not just in regard to our relationship to our fellow man and that sort of thing, but how bad sin is to God. 
and that God hates sin. Right. Yes, he loves the sinner. Gave his brother, his son, to save the sinner. But God hates sin. Right. We're told in Isaiah 64 and <laughs> verse 6, but we are all as, unclean, uh, as an unclean thing, and all our righteous deeds are as filthy rags. Uh, Isaiah was writing to God's people Israel during the time that they had turned away from God. Right. And they, they just didn't want to hear anything about God. And, and, and they even challenged God when Isaiah told them about what God could do uh, in regard to punishing them. They said, well, let us see what he can do. I mean, how far away from God can you get when you are challenging him <coughs> and his ability to punish? So Isaiah, in his instruction to them, wanted them to understand that all of your righteous deeds are as filthy rags. That is to say, that as we look at ourselves and we look at the perfect holiness of God, we don't look too good. We don't smell too good. I said that. And we need to keep that in mind. That our deeds, the best that we can do is like filthy rags compared to the perfect holiness of God. Think for just a moment, perhaps the one person that you've ever met even, you don't necessarily have to know them all that well other than you understand and recognize that that's a godly person right there. Who is the most godly person that you've ever met in your life? And whomever it is that you come up with, that person's righteousness is as filthy rags compared to the perfect holiness and righteousness of God. Because he is 100% pure and we are not. Not even the best of us has a heart anywhere close to the purity that would be needed to live with God in eternity. That is why Jesus' message of repentance was rejected by the religious folks who should have been the first to welcome him. That was a statement in one of the devotions that we had a couple of weeks ago. It was entitled, Do We Deny the Lord's Diagnosis? We are not fit to be in the very presence of God when we have sin on our soul, when we have sin in our hearts. We're told by Jesus to just emphasize and verify that fact. So likewise ye, when ye have done all those things which are commanded you, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. And I so much appreciated Brother Jeremy's thoughts and the words that he shared with us. And for those of you who missed out on that winter lectureship, you missed something marvelous. Something that is priceless because of the wonderful thoughts that he brought to our minds during the six lectures that he presented. And if you were not able to come, please go to our website and listen to them because they challenge you, it will build you up, it will encourage you, and you'll just feel better having watched and listened to God's word as it was presented by him. Jesus wanted to say that after you've done everything that you're supposed to do, that you've been commanded to do, then say, I am an unprofitable servant because I've just done my duty in the first place. And I appreciated Brother Jeremy because he emphasized the plan of salvation in his, in his sermons. And he emphasized the fact that after we take God's word and allow it to, to produce faith in Jesus as the Son of God, and as a result of being convinced that Jesus is the Son of God in repentance, we seek to turn from our sins in godly sorrow for the sin that we have committed against him in days gone by. And it produces a willingness for us to make a confession of our faith that he is the son of God. Mm -hmm. And then be baptized, put to death, and buried with Christ into his death so that we can rise up like Christ was raised from the dead. We can rise up from the dead. Have you ever thought about this? Mm -hmm. We rise up from the dead of putting our old man of sin away and we 
are to walk in newness of life. Amen. But brethren, do not miss this one fact. That after you've done that, according to Jesus in Luke chapter 17 and verse 10, you're still an unpros unprofitable servant. In other words, you have not done anything to improve the fact that you're a sinner. It takes the grace of God. And we are saved by the grace of God. Our obedience, to be sure, just like Brother Jeremy emphasized. But our obedience short of the grace of God does not accomplish a salvation and a heavenly home. And so we need to recognize that if we want God's word to do what it's supposed to do, we have to let it do that. Romans chapter 3, verse 23, and chapter 6, verse 23, we're familiar with. All that sin and come short of the glory of God, the wages of sin is death. The free gift of God is salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. Secondly, if we want the Word of God to do what it's supposed to do, the Word of God has been given so we will humble ourselves before Him. Brethren, please listen carefully to this. We have to humble ourselves before God if God's Word can have the effect upon us that it's supposed to. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and He will exalt you. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is a way of death. You know, we, we just, somehow or another, we've got the idea that we just know anything and everything. Hmm. We're so proud of ourselves and our accomplishments. But God has told us, you know, there's a way that seems right to you, but if you just pay close attention, it doesn't do anything but end up in your spiritual death. It's not going to profit you anything in regard to your soul's eternal destiny. Whoops. I know, O oh Lord, that, the man, that a man's way is not in himself, nor is it in a man who walks to direct his own steps. We don't know how to get from here to heaven short of submitting to the word of God. Amen. Artificial intelligence, I think, can be a marvelous thing. But even those who are part of developing AI are saying it's getting to be real dangerous what that stuff can do. Uh -huh. And just like in the movie 2001 Space Odyssey concerning how we need to pull the plug before it gets out to a point to where we can't undo what we've done. Because we cannot of our own way get to heaven. Right. Brethren, that's the only thing that counts is to get to heaven. Mm -hmm. So God says about his word that it's a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Mm -hmm. And boy, ladies and gentlemen, brethren, <clears throat> hold this thing as the greatest treasure you have on the face of this earth. Mm -hmm. Because this is the thing that gives us direction and illuminates our way to God. Right. There are six things which the Lord hates. Get this. There are six things that the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. And the very first thing that he mentions is a proud look. Do not miss what that verse of scripture says. It says God hates pride. And the reason why God hates pride is because our pride prevents us from letting God's word do what it's supposed to do. We somehow or another got the idea that we know better than God. <laughs> we sometimes get the idea that we are superior to others because of our education or whatever, and that we have all the answers, and just ask me and I can tell you what the answer is. God's wisdom is so far above us. We're told, my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Regardless of how smart you might be, regardless of how much of an education you might have, you don't have the smarts of God. You need to listen to God. And walk in the word of God because it's the only way to get to heaven. We have to allow God's word to 
make us what God expects of us. I think that sometimes we don't we don't really think about the fact that God has expectations of us. I gave my son to die for you. I expect something in return. And he has a right to expect certain, certain things in return because he made the ultimate sacrifice for us to take away our sins. Mm -hmm. We're told in 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for uh, correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect or complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And we... We just do the best we can to eliminate the idea that we're supposed to be perfect in the sight of God. Therefore, you are to be perfect as my heavenly Father is perfect. Isn't it interesting that Brother Jones in our, in our winter lectureship said the word can make us whole. And the reason why we need to pay attention to what Brother Jones had to say is because God said, be holy, for I am holy. Mm -hmm. Now I want you to pay attention to what Jesus said and what God has said. Jesus said, we are to be perfect, mm -hmm. even as our Heavenly Father is perfect. And we are to be holy, God said, because I'm holy. Mm -hmm. Brethren, look at those two words, those two little bitty, two, two, two letter words, be you are to be. That is to say that God is telling us, I'm not making a suggestion here. I'm not telling you to do the best you can. I'm not telling you that, you know, just keep striving, just keep going, keep pressing on, do the very best that you possibly can. He is telling us to be holy and to be perfect. And you know what? We can be. We can be in the sight of God. Abraham is held up as the ultimate example of faith. And we read in the regard to Abraham that his faith was considered righteousness. And his faith was credited to him as righteousness before God. That word righteousness, what's that all about? Being right. Being absolutely right in the sight of God. If we can be right in the sight of God... Can we not be perfect in the sight of God? Doing what he tells us? Oh, I know. Nobody's perfect. No, I understand that. And I understand that we stumble and fall. Quit leaving God's grace out of the equation. Our faith is reckoned unto us as righteousness, being right in the sight of God. And everything that we leave out as we are striving to obey God, God fixes that with His grace. Because we don't get to heaven without God's grace. Lastly, this morning, God's Word was given either to con condemn us or convict us. And we see that in God's word. You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of air, that you were at that time separate from Christ, having no hope and without God in the world. A person that's in that condition is truly condemned. Is absolutely condemned. We read over in John chapter 3, verse 18, as Jesus was still talking with Nicodemus. And he said, he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son. Look what Jesus says here. If you are not a true believer in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, the Lord of your life, the chosen one of God to take away the sin of the world, if you are not living to allow Jesus to be your Lord and Master, you're condemning yourself. I've heard so many people that I've talked with about obeying the gospel and the dangers of hell. 
and the horribleness of hell. And almost every single time, without fail, the answer comes back to me, well, I don't want a God that would send me to hell. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to me. God sends nobody to hell. You send yourself to hell because of your disobedience and or your lack of faith in Jesus Christ that leads you into repentance and baptism for the remission of your sins. And so these two verses guide us to the fact that the word of God condemns those who refuse to believe and obey. But let's talk about this convicting us business. Therefore, let all the house of Israel on the day of Pentecost know assuredly that God hath made this same Jesus whom you crucified, that would be people standing before Pilate saying, His blood be upon us and on our children. Both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked or pierced in their heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And then Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And Brother, Brother Jeremy used this particular passage of Scripture in almost every one of his sermons. For the, the promise is unto you and to your children and all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. That's talking about you and me here today. If you are a Christian, it's because you've answered God's call. If you are not a Christian, it's because you have not answered God's call unto repentance and baptism. Right. With many other words, you can testify and exhort and say, Save yourselves from this perverse generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. God's word is given to us to convince us I'm a sinner. And I am dead in my sins. I'm without Christ, having no hope, and without God in the world. And God's word is his power to convict you of that very fact. And to call you to say, what do I need to do to be saved? All right. This morning, what we need to do to be saved is to believe that Jesus is the Christ, yeah. the Son of God. That he is the answer for your sins. The only answer for your sins. Because as Jerry, Brother Jeremy quoted, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. It takes your belief in him as the Son of God. You're willing to turn from your present lifestyle that is sinful in the sight of God. To confess your faith in him yeah. as the Son of God. And then be buried with Jesus Christ yeah. into his death. And allow his blood, as Tim talked about before we partook of the communion this morning, to allow his blood to wash away your sin Amen. and to come up out of that water absolutely perfect. Amen. Sinners in the sight of God. <coughs> and allow his grace to take care of the times that you fall and ask for forgiveness that you may have eternal life with God. Amen. And we pray this morning that if there's anyone here that needs to do that, or if there's anyone here this morning that has done that, but you know you've been shortchanging God because you haven't been living a good life of following in the footsteps of Jesus, let us know so that we can study with you, so that we can pray with you, so that we can encourage you. Because that's what we're here for. Can we serve you in your obedience to God this morning? as we stand in the same